Hello, everyone, and welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. Make sure you're following and subscribe to the podcast so you never ne- miss an episode. Visit the PAS Report website, pasreport.com. And I have a fantastic guest today. I have Steve Baker, Blaze TV, the pragmatic con- constitutionalist. He's going to be joining me, and we got a lot to talk about because there is a fire raging through this country, and so many people's heads are buried in the sand. So before we even start off, Steve, how are you today? Hey, Nick, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Well, as good as can be. Now, I I want my audience to just get an idea of of your background a little bit. So uh, how long have you been an investigative journalist, and, and you've been at the Pragmatic Constitutionalist running that uh, for quite some time. So can you just explain it to the audience? Yeah, you know, my, my story in, in terms of what I do and how I got here is, is you know, not that complicated. I, I've been a lifelong musician. Um, and, and in terms of my investigative chops, that started back with my father. My father was a fairly, fairly well-renowned uh, private investigator going back in the 70s, 80s. Uh, and And so I used to work with him when I was not on the road touring with bands. And so that's kind of where I cut my chops on the investigative side. And then I started writing as as more or less a side hustle or a hobby back in really, really, I've written, I've been a writer my whole life, but but I I started, I really started, uh, you know, exercising my skills in that regard back in the old early days of the internet back when it was prodigy and CompuServe and um, AOL and then that all became MySpace and I said my my audience will never know what dial-up sounds like yeah yeah right 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 and uh, yeah we literally I I literally would strap a phone onto a, a, a modem you know with a velcro strap and hear all the noises and the beeps and the chirps and the chimes and then you would get this blazing speed you know um but this uh this this all evolved into a political page on myspace and then uh, i think it was around 2008 um i migrated like most of everybody else did away from myspace over to facebook and started using the facebook notes platform as my blog which they eventually quit supporting but nevertheless i, I had a very active following there on uh on facebook and and so um when it you know when when covid came to town in 2020 um my side hustle or my you know hobby of of being doing political commentary and analysis and that sort of thing uh, became my full-time job because the government took my other job away from me being a, a live performer musician i wasn't allowed to work anymore uh, i was told you know for 15 18 months that i couldn't perform that i couldn't you're not essential yeah that's exactly right i was a non-essential worker despite the fact that i went to college on a trumpet performance scholarship and they told me that oh yeah you can do that for a living and then they said you know 40 years later no you can't do that for a living uh, <laughs> so um that's what happened and it, it's not complicated so i i ramped up the other side i took my i took my my musicianship or my lifelong you know job as as a performing musician and i moved that over to the co-pilot seat and i grabbed my writing you know career or or hobby and i moved that to the captain's chair of my life and and that was that was the era in which that switch happened and then while that was taking place while we were in the middle or i was in the middle of reinventing my life at that age um then january 6th happened and i was there as a journalist to cover the event and i want to focus on that so you're like me where we believe in small limited government right you know that we saw the big government apparatus well we we've seen it ramp up starting in 2001 and beyond and during the coronavirus, I mean, that was just atrocious what the government did, determining what businesses are essential, which ones aren't, when people could leave their homes, where they could go, when, where, and how they could practice their faith. I mean, it was authoritarian. If you look at it by any metric, authoritarianism is when decisions are made by one or a handful of people. Now, you decided, I'm going to use this, and, and now you have to catapult it to your full time position, your captain's chair, and, and you start really focusing on a lot of political events. You're at January 6th. You go down to cover, you know, the the Trump rally that's going to be taking place. At the same time, Congress is having the Electoral College certifications going on. From there, what happens? 
Yeah, it's again, the story is very simple. Uh, I was there to cover an event. I showed up with my, you know, my camera, my tripod, my man on the street microphone, intending to do uh, interviews on the street and get people's impressions about the event. I went there not as a Trump supporter. In fact, I never have been. I'm, I'm one of those. And, uh, you know, I'm a pretty hardcore libertarian. And and as a result of that, I was there as an observer. I was actually there with another writer of some esteem, and he and I were there to observe and to go home and write stories about it. And I was hoping to pick up a few interviews along the way. And then, of course, the, the, the story developed differently than what we anticipated. We followed the crowd to the Capitol. Uh, what happened at the Capitol as, as obscene and, you know, uh, unfortunate as it was, is was newsworthy and so that's where my camera followed i followed the story to the west front uh terrace uh, battle line and from there uh after the, after that line collapsed and people broke through and the story went up onto the upper terrace i followed the story there and then the story went inside the building and me and 60 other journalists went through those doors and covered the story but they're only going after now those journalists who did not submit their stories to the right publications so well, as a and it's not only so HBO and a few other networks actually purchased your coverage. They they purchased your videos of the events of that day, documenting what was taking place, what was happening in real time. So you have entities, big media conglomerates purchasing your video that you took. But now it turns out that the FBI says, well, we don't like what you're doing. And, and so you got a, a call the other day from your attorney. I think it was at CPAC. While you were at CPAC, mm -hmm. you got a call from your attorney. What What did your attorney say to you? <laughs> well, my attorney let me know on uh, Friday afternoon that my time had come, that after two and a half years of the Department of Justice and the FBI threatening me with arrest and with prosecution, that in fact that they were going to initiate that and that I had to uh, turn myself in to the FBI this week, which is happening tomorrow morning. And so I got to get this straight because it's hard to wrap your head around this. I mean, as a country that's supposed to be founded on the principles of limited government, as the Bill of Rights clearly lays out in our Constitution in the fir very First Amendment, the, the enshrined power of freedom of the press, our government doesn't get to dictate our rights. I mean, the whole point of the Bill of Rights is it limits government power. It tells the government what it can't do. And yet here they are, they're arresting you now. What are the charges? They haven't told us yet. Uh, they won't tell me until the charges are unsealed tomorrow morning uh, at my presentation before the magistrate. Um, they they did to uh, back in November of 21 was the first time that they told me that I would be charged within the week. And they did give us the charges at the time that has since evolved. And so this time they're not giving it to me specifically because they know I'll go public with it. And they don't want, uh, they don't want that happening again. Cause I did last time. <laughs> well, I mean, it, when you're looking at it on it, it, it's completely ridiculous. It's actually preposterous. Now, ha do you know of any journalists from let's say CNN that was there or MSNBC or any, any type of Democrat or Democrat leaning network that was covering it, have any of those journalists been arrested for entering no, the Capitol building? The, charge. the the fifth person through the West uh, Upper West Terrace, uh, what they call the uh, Northwest Wing or Senate Wing door, the first person through that window that was breached, um, where it was busted, you know, busted out, the fifth person through that window was a New York Times journalist. And they're still free. They haven't been indicted on anything. No, no, of course not. And then, of course, you have the story of uh, Luke Mogelson, who went through that, also went through the same broken window. And he was, uh, he submitted his story to the New Yorker, and he captured the famous video in the Senate chamber of the QAnon shaman praying and doing, you know, all of that kind of thing. And so uh, when, when uh, he submitted his story, the title of his story was Among the Insurrectionists. And so obviously his story comported with the narrative, giving him the get out of jail free card that he needed. And that's what's happening right now. So the only the only people that are being um, uh, charged in terms of for their journalism that day are people that are from the more right 
leaning side of the political spectrum, but none of the mainstream journalists, whether they're independent, whether they work for a large company, whether they were credentialed or not, are being uh, threatened with prosecution. And it's very, yeah, I mean, it's a very uh, overt display of, of selective prosecution right now. If the Department of Justice was balanced and if, if, um, uh, all things were, you know, if the scales of justice were were balanced and equal right now, they would be bringing in more of them because there were more of the left wing journalists that went through the doors than there were right wing journalists that went through the door. It really is stunning how this is all playing out because here we are. I mean, it's not like this is March of 2021. We're we're now three years on this. Yeah, this is three years later that that they're targeting you. H has the New York Times and any of the journalists from the Times that were there or anyone, ha have they written articles that have been critical of, of the FBI and the government since then? Not that I'm aware of, not 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 with regards to this. Um, but you I have. have. I have. I have. Certainly, I've been poking that bear for three years very, very harshly. Um, it's part of the reason that they're treating me the way they're treating me tomorrow. Well, we can get into that in a second, but to answer your question more specifically, I have collegial relationships with some mainstream uh, media journalists from New York Times, Washington Post, NBC, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I anticipate that they will be writing stories about my arrest after after tomorrow, they because they are court reporters, they're legal affairs uh, journalists. This is going to be a big story for them. Uh, I don't know how they're going to frame it. I don't know if they're going to be hit pieces. I I mean, I just don't know. Uh, but uh, they certainly will be covering it after my arrest. Well, if they had an ounce of integrity, they, they'd all come out in unison and, and denounce what the FBI is doing. If they actually had integrity and believed in, in the idea of journalism, they, they would the scream the about thing. this going yeah. on because this is very dangerous, uh, the road that we're going down. And an, another thing that I, I find really disgraceful is, is the fact that you have this overbearing government. OK, the FBI is one of the most, if not the most powerful entity, you know, between the FBI, the IRS. These are powerful entities that could destroy your life. They're, they're powerful entities that could crush ordinary Americans. And now they're using all the resources of the government to bring you down as we see the failures of the open borders, our education system has collapsed, the you know, the the entire world's on fire. But you're the you're the one that represents this grave existential threat to the United States. Now you've actually spoken with journalists that you have contacts with, uh, that also have contacts in the Department of Justice. Did they give you warnings about your reporting that, you know, hey, you may want to back off because uh, the Department of Justice isn't too pleased with your report or anything like that? Going back uh, as far back as almost exactly a year ago was the first time that I received word directly from a source within the Department of Justice that uh, there were um, uh, uh, certain people inside <laughs> that building in D.C. that were not happy with the work that I was working on and I needed to be careful and, and be looking over my shoulder. I actually got that warning from a friendly journalist in D.C. Uh, my second warning that I got was similar to that, and this was directly from a source inside the, the DOJ. And uh, they said that the um, Department of Justice was terrified on one, about one of the stories that I was working on. And, then and what story just, was that? That was the I believe. Well, I, I I'm working on several, but the one that I think that they're most concerned about is my ongoing work on the uh, Capitol Police uh, corruption and the Capitol Police perjuries in the Oath Keepers trial, because that gets too close to the Star Chamber in the DOJ that framed those guys, and that's what they're most concerned about. Um, they know that I know more than we've been able to release yet, because I can't obviously go public with everything that I know because I don't have the documentation in hand. I just have. Uh, uh, you know, deep throat sources right at the, at the present. And so they know that I know what I know <laughs> and they don't want you to know what I know. And so that is, uh, we believe, part of this pro process uh, that, that I'm going through is 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 to uh, you know, 
throw a wet blanket over me, uh, put a gag order on me. We don't know. We we have no idea what the judge is going to do to me. We don't know if the judge is going to put a gag order on me, on me or not. Uh, we don't know uh, if they're going to restrict my travels to D.C., even though I have a congressional press pass myself, or they're going to say I can't work anymore in D.C. because they've done that to all the other uh, J6 uh, defendants. And uh, it'll be a it'll be an interesting fight between my legal team and and the the DOJ if they try to put that travel restriction on me. Uh, but we're we're anticipating that that's going to happen. There's so many questions to it, but the one specifically that, that I think that they were most terrified about, to go back and answer your question, is the story of Special Agent David Lazarus, who perjured himself in the Oath Keepers trial, who I proved that conclusively with the Capitol CCTV videos that he could, not only did he not see what he claimed to see, not only did he not witness what he claimed to witness, not only did he not have the encounters that he claimed to have had count the encounters with at the time he claimed, he couldn't have because he wasn't in the same building. Yeah, and, well, he and, uh, and there was no and there was no reason for him to make this up on his own. He was that perjury was suborned by someone. Well, I mean, let's be honest here. There are so many open questions about, about the deep rooted institutional corruption that that exists. I mean, you know, again, I, I always go back to the pipe bombings to this day that you had a pipe bomb over at RNC headquarters, a pipe bomb over at DNC headquarters. The vice president was actually at DNC headquarters that morning. And yet all this time later, so here they are three years later telling you you need to turn yourself in, yet we we still don't have any real information on, on the pipe bombs. I mean, that to me is astounding. What are your well, thoughts on that? No. Well, hey, uh, if you followed my story and my work on the blaze, we've done more information on the pipe bomb than anybody else. Uh, yep. We've shown we've shown that, again, the Capitol Police, someone in the command center there at the Capitol Police turned the investigative cameras away from the investigation scene. Not only did I reveal that there's two of them that have been turned away, uh, Joe Hanneman at the Epic Times has just released, uh, he's found a third camera that was turned off of the scene. And um, then, of course, we had the reporting from Julie Kelly and uh, Darren Beatty um, and the additional uh, work that we did talking about, you know, what, why was Kamala Harris there that day? Why wasn't she in the, you know, why Senate chamber as Senate Capitol? president? Right, right, right. Uh, you know, she was the, the VP elect and she was also a voting center, senator and she was not there for one of the most important ceremonial you know, days of the year, which was to certify the electoral college vote. And for some reason, she wasn't there. And then for, and then again, for some reason, inexplicably, completely makes no sense whatsoever. How is it that any politician is going to be that close to a quote unquote, you know, deadly threat of a, what the FBI calls a viable explosive device? And she's never mentioned it one time in three years, not once ever. It took a year before Politico even found out that she was in the DNC and not at the Capitol. That took a year. Somebody had to hide that information. Politico dug, dug that up. I've asked Kyle Cheney at Politico, what else do you know about this? He said it took, he said it was like, you know, pulling teeth just to get that information confirmed from her staff that she was even there. And then since then, since it has been confirmed and has been reported by multiple agencies that she was inside the building when the pipe bomb was discovered and that she, her, her motorcade drove within 15 feet of the bomb. And and so another two years later, she's never mentioned that one time. Never and been do we know if when the bomb that. was identified, do we know if she was whisked away out of a DNC headquarters? Yeah, we 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 actually uh, we actually showed that. We showed the video of her being uh, evacuated. Yeah, and so she's evacuated, and then all of a sudden it just goes radio silence on this. You don't hear the anything after. No, they turn all the cameras away from the investigation, and then she goes radio silent. And not only was, has she been radio silent, but again, why is the D.C. media so incurious? Why don't they ask her? Think about in the last three years, or the last two years since we've known she was there, why is no one in the D.C. media, in the multiple press conferences, in the multiple sit-down interviews that she has done, why has anybody ever said to her, uh, you know, Miss Vice President, Madam Vice President, why, uh, how do you feel about being so close 
to a, you know, a bomb that day? Did you feel this was a threat on your life? Did, was, was this an assassination attempt, do you think? Um, uh, how come nobody in the D.C. media has ever asked her those questions? Because most of them are frauds. That's why. <laughs> well, most of, most of them are reading from the script that is given to them and told what questions they can and cannot ask. And for some reason, this question, this line of questioning is being embargoed. It's amazing. Now, when you were told that, you know, you may need to watch your back, that you're making people upset, what actually went through your mind when other journalists were telling you this? Um, <laughs> I, I did not commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> I I I I I was not uh, Clintonized. I was not Arkansas. You weren't Epstein. I, I was not Epstein. No, all, all of these thoughts went through my went through my mind, and I I did exactly what I think was the best thing for me to do was I became more vocal, more uh, loud about it. I became more aggressive in getting the information out that I know because that's the best. Uh, that's the best protection you know you know they, they, they say you know sunlight's the best disinfectant but the best way to protect myself is to not only have additional people that know what i know and so we have we have what we call dead man switches i have several of those set up so if they take me out this information is going to come out but in addition to that um if they throw me into the gulag and put me in solitary confinement for two years it's still coming out yeah, and, and they've actually done that with a lot of the J6 people, right? I mean, they, they, some have been in solitary confinement. And we're not talking about, you know, the judges of sedition, like like the government likes to throw out their insurrection. We're talking about people that are actually in prison on, on minor things, very minor things that have not had access to the courts in any good way, that that, that have been isolated in the prison community. Uh, that There's many complaints that their human rights are being abused, are you worried that may be you? As of right now, we are assured that they're not going to do that to me. Uh, we are assured that my after my arraignment tomorrow that I am going to be released on my own recognizance. The, they, have a, they have told me that I'm not going to be detained. We have that in writing. If they go back on their word, then we'll publish their we'll publish their statements. Um, and, uh, and of course my attorneys will raise holy hell, but, but, uh, I'm not, so I'm not anticipating that they'll do that. Um, it would be, it wouldn't be the best PR move on their behalf, considering that, you know, I work for place <laughs> to. Yeah, that definitely helps. Now, uh, another thing I find curious is, is when they did tell your lawyer that you need to turn yourself in was they told you what you should wear, apparently. Yeah, they they told me that I needed to arrive in uh, shorts, a t-shirt, and flip flops. Why? Yeah, uh, it, it's easier and better for them in terms of having me change into my orange jumpsuit and leg chains. Okay, so my advice is wear like the most annoying three piece suit that you could find. That takes forever to take off. They're, they're, I, I'm not going to allow them to take my dignity away from me. I'm a professional. I'm going to show up dressed like a professional. Um, and they're gonna they're going to have to deal with that. Well, and I think what you just said is key, that you're a professional. What happened to our government bureaucrats where, what have they lost over the years? It used to be public servants understood that they're there to serve the public. Now it appears they exist to rule over the public. Yeah, right, right, right. What's your thoughts about that? Well, that that's what it is. I mean, look, the, the, the whole concept of a public servant is... That's uh, Orwellian newspeak now. It doesn't mean what it means, except for a micro fraction of those on working Capitol Hill. They're not there for public service. They're there for personal aggrandizement. They're there for power. They're there for um, uh, their six figure uh, paychecks and their insider trading knowledge, um, that w which allows them to become multi gazillionaires in a matter of a couple of terms of office. Uh, that that's that's why they're there. Uh, whether they went there with that intention or not, that's what most of them have become. I, I used to say that I only could count, you know, twelve or fifteen really good men and women on Capitol Hill. I think I'm down to less than maybe one hand now. The way I feel well, I have to ask. I mean, since you announced that you do have to turn yourself in, ha have any members of Congress or their staffs reached out to you expressing any type of concern whatsoever? 
I, uh, throughout my process, I've had two that have reached out to me directly. Um, uh, Congressman Barry Loudermilk from Georgia uh, has been very vocal. He actually tweeted out in my um, uh, in support of me yesterday, and I've worked very closely with him and his staff at the um, uh, oversight subcommittee that's investigating the you know, Capitol Police and, and other J6 issues. Is I've that the Weaponization with, Committee? Uh, no, that's a different committee. This okay. is the 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 house admins subcommittee gotcha. on oversight and and that's who has oversight over the capitol police and then i've worked very closely with uh thomas massey's staff uh and that's weaponization right there and worked with the weaponization committee investigators worked very closely with them gotten support from these guys and then um going back to the very beginning um the first congress or the first call i ever got was the first time i was uh, threatened with prosecution back in 21 i got a call from senator ron johnson out of wisconsin and so uh, i've spoken to him and his investigators as well and are you concerned? Because let's face it, I mean, you're being charged in Washington, D.C., and we know that people haven't fared well in Washington, D.C. based on, on their political leanings or uh, based on any type of dissent from the government narrative and the media narratives. Uh, are you concerned that this whole thing is nothing more than a show and, and you know, pretty much it's set in stone that they're going to try and force you into either pigeonhole you into a plea bargain or something like that. Well, that's, I mean, first of all, that's their modus operandi. They're, they're going to uh, offer me a sweet plea deal uh, in order to avoid a trial and avoid the embarrassment of a trial and all of that. And the potential um, the ramifications of knowing that 99.75% of the J sixers have lost at trial in DC that's that's the stat. Uh, that's just the reality. And I think and the so, only ones that did win did a trial by judge rather than jury, right? Is yeah, that correct? That's correct. Yeah, hundred percent of the jury, the jurors uh, have have not got come out of their unscathed. And so the um, uh, the reality is is that we know that I'll be offered a plea deal, and we know that that plea deal will come with the additional threat that if I don't take it that I will be uh, uh, facing a superseding indictment, which will probably include felonies. Now, and obviously you don't know yet, but if the plea deal includes you to stop reporting and turn over work that you've already done, what are your thoughts about that? Not going to happen. See, and that's integrity right there. I'm, I'm, look, I, I have, I have prayed over and over and over again that this cup passed for me. And if I can over spiritualize it even one more step, I'm ready to be pouring out poured out as a drink offering to the altar of liberty if I have to. Well, and I think that's what separates right. you from a lot of people in this day and age that, uh, again, I stated at the beginning of the podcast that many Americans have their heads buried in the sand. They don't realize that the government, the central government has consolidated an enormous amount of power that our agencies ha have been ideologically weaponized to target political opponents and they don't realize how quickly that could turn on them um what would your advice be to the american people today yeah and uh it's 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 trite it's um sometimes feels useless and fruitless but they need to be ringing up their congressmen and their senators right now and demanding that this stop, the House of Representatives could defund the DOJ and the FBI right now, or at least threaten them and say, you either stop this, you stop this persecution, you stop this overbearing prosecution, you're, you're, you, they could look at the FBI, they could look at the DOJ and say, your FBI has never in the history of that agency swatted misdemeanor defendants. In fact, They've never dealt with misdemeanor defenses until January 6th. And now they're swatting those defendants for misdemeanors, putting the red dots with automatic rifles on them and their family and their children, their wives, in the cold of the morning at 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning. And then they're throwing misdemeanor defendants in medium security prisons that don't house any other misdemeanor defendants at all. None. And putting them in solitary confinement in these prisons where no misdemeanor de defendants are confined unless you're a J6er. 
And they have to look at this agency and say, you stop it or we defund you. And Congress could do this. They don't need they don't need the Senate. They don't need a presidential signature. They could do this right now. Well, it appears we lost Steve. Apparently, the feds are running interference and they don't want this episode to air. But too bad because we got most of it. Got it. In any event, I, everyone needs to follow Steve's story because it really shows you the dark path that the United States is on. It really shows you how the people in power have become nothing more than little Mussolini wannabes where anyone that provides any type of, of dissent or different narrative they, they aim to crush. They want to silence them. They want to censor them. And they will use the weight and power of the central government to do just that. That's why it's so important that we return to limited government. In any event, I'm going to have all Steve's links up at the PAS Report website, pasreport.com. So make sure that, that you follow him, visit his website, support him in any way you can, and, and we'll keep on top of this story. Hopefully, we'll have Steve back in a few weeks so he can give us an update. For now, I want to thank you for joining me, and I'll see you on Wednesday with another great episode of the PAS Report podcast.